Hello, class. Welcome to your last lecture of Intro to Anatomy, Chapter 20. And with Chapter 20, we got a couple things to talk about, all really geared to towards how do you develop? How do I form a human being? So we're going to talk about well, growth, development, pregnancy, and we'll finish off this chapter with genetics. Really, how do you pass your genes on from yourself to your offspring? Or how did your parents pass their gen genes off to you? So a couple things to talk about, but it's all geared to how did you form? Okay, we're talking about growth and development. We usually hear those two terms said together, growth and development. Because as you develop, well, well yes, you will grow. That's actually in the definition. Development involves growth and aging. And what is growth? Well, most people know what that means. It means to get bigger, increase in size. And the way your body increases in size is mainly by your cells. Either increasing the number of cells you have and or increasing the size of the cells you have. That's how you're going to grow. And we're going to talk about how that happens in this chapter. Mainly starting off by looking at how you form from the very beginning. Okay, We're going to look at the different phases of your life. We're going to go from the beginning to the end. And when we look at your life overall in this class, we break it in really into two major parts. There's the prenatal period and there's the postnatal period. And this is your entire life. It's all based off timing. Your prenatal period is you up until you're born. Okay. But after you're born, until you die, that's your postnatal period. Okay, so we're going to look at the events that occur in your prenatal period from conception to birth. And then we'll look at what happens in your postnatal period after birth and yeah, all the way until you die. Oh yeah, we're all made up of cells and you remember our cells will get old and die and because of that, so will we. But first, oh, we got to start about, talk about the beginning. What happens first? Well, I told you, your prenatal period is from conception until birth. What is conception? Well, it has to do with your parents' sex cells. And the sex cells are sperm cells for males and egg cells for females. And because this is anatomy, things have many names. You could call a female egg cell an oocyte or an ovum. These are synonyms for egg, oocyte or ovum. All right, so we have to begin with those two cells. They're going to come together and they're going to form a single cell organism, you, at this point, called a zygote. So we got to talk about that. How do the sperm and oocyte, aka ovum, meet to form you, this single-celled zygote? We got to talk about it. The process of having the sperm cell and the egg cell come together is called fertilization. I want you to know that definition. It's the joining or fusion of the sperm and egg cell. And I want you to know where does it occur. Turns out a fertilization occurs in the uterine tube. Oh boy, think back uh, to reproductive system. We did female reproductive system. Remember the uterine tube are those, those long extensions coming off the uterus. That's where fertilization is going to occur. And at the end of fertilization, you will have, uh, have conceived a, a zygote, a single-celled organism that will develop into a person. So we're going to have to talk about how do you get the sperm and egg cell to meet and fuse. How do you conceive a zygote? Well, it begins here. Well, it's going to involve sexual intercourse, or if you're uh, in a lab, you could do it in vitro. When you hear in vitro fertilization, they're talking about out of the body and in a lab. Either, in either case, the sperm cell needs to make the egg cell. And it turns out the sperm cell is going to need some help to do that. Oh, it takes a, a while. It's a long journey, so to speak, for the sperm cell to reach the egg cell. And along the way, it's going to need some help. 
mainly from some hormones is what it's gonna get help from. You're gonna see lots of hormones in this chapter. Because remember, hormones are tiny little chemicals that can boss things around. They're gonna help to tell things what to do. For example, the sperm cell in its early development cannot move. A sperm cell, when it's formed, doesn't move. It needs to mature before that whip-like tail becomes mobile. And it needs kind of some stimulation to get that tail moving. It's gonna get the stimulation from what we call prostaglandins. They're just chemicals signaling these cells to begin moving. And when the sperm is in the female's body, it has a way to go. It has to make its way from the vagina all the way to the uterine tube where fertilization occurs, where it can meet an egg cell, AKA an ovum or an oocyte. And turns out it's gonna get some kind of obs obstruction. There's gonna be some obstacles along the way the sperm cell is gonna have to overcome. And they're gonna be in the female body. It turns out the uterus has some secretions. It pumps things out. And at certain periods of time, those secretions can be a little thick and hard for the sperm cell to travel. So to help it to travel through these secretions, we kind of loosen things up. And again, it's going to be a hormone that's going to help it out. A uh, hormone people have heard before, it's estrogen. Females make lots of estrogen. AKA, uh, also, FYI, males do make estrogen. It's just that females make more. And one reason has to do with reproduction. Turns out estrogen kind of helps to loosen up some of those secretions in the uterus. So that it's easier for the sperm cell to make its way to the egg cell. So, yes, yeah, sperm cells need help. They need to be told to start moving. Prostaglandins will help do that. And once they're in the female body, you're going to have to loosen up some uterine secretions. And estrogen is going to help with that. And this, this is a long journey. you got to think, these are cells. We've seen pictures of the uterine tube. I'm just going forward to show pictures. You've seen pictures of the uterine tube coming off the uterus. That's what we're seeing here. It's not that long. Maybe a couple inches. But it takes a while for the sperm cell to make it all the way to this uterine tube. And along the way, it's getting help from those hormones, like estrogen. And it takes a while. It takes about an hour for a sperm cell to travel through the vagina, travel through the uterine cavity, and make it into the uterine tube, where hopefully it will meet an egg waiting to be fertilized. And that's what we're seeing in this picture. We're seeing an egg, this large round structure is the egg, AKA the oocyte or the ovum. And all these little gray little structures on top of it are the sperm cells trying to fertilize this egg. Oh, but again, they're gonna need some help. You could pretend that the female egg is kind of like a, a chicken egg. How so? Oh, Dr. Higgs, make it make sense. How is a female egg kind of like a chicken egg? Well, if you ever cooked eggs, chicken eggs, you, you know you gotta crack a shell to get to the yolk inside. Well, it's almost like the female has this shell around the egg. It's not a real shell. Please don't think females are dropping eggs like chickens, no. But it is surrounding the egg. It's really a collection of cells that surround the egg and the sperm cell is gonna have to get through this really layers of cells around the egg. And because this is anatomy, we're gonna name everything. This layer of cells surrounding the egg is what we call the corona radiata. And the sperm cell is gonna have to penetrate this layer of cells. Let me show you a picture, here it is. So this picture up top is showing us a female egg and surrounding it, are you see, you're seeing are layers of cells. These layers of cells are called zona, or corona radiata. And the sperm cells are going to have to make their way through this corona radiata, this layer of cells. And again, they're going to need help. Turns out on the tips of the sperm cells, on the tips of the heads, what we're seeing in this picture down below, it turns out the tips of the heads are filled with a little sac that's filled with fluid. 
And in that fluid are enzymes. We call them acrosomal enzymes because this little sac is called the acrosome. It's this little fluid-filled sac on the tip of the head of the sperm cell. And in that acrosome are acrosomal enzymes. And the job of these enzymes is to help erode this er corona radiata, break down these layers of cells surrounding the egg so that the sperm can get to it. Oh, but guess what? Uh-oh. Just breaking down the corona radiata is not good enough. Going back to this picture here. Turns out it's more than just a layer of cells surrounding the eggs. We see the cells in this picture, but then you see this bluish layer. Almost looks like water. It's not water. It's another layer of protection around the egg. Ah, oh, this is called the zona pellucida. Your zona pellucida is just a, really a membrane surrounding the egg. And it's a thick membrane the sperm cell is going to have to get through as well. So there's lots of protection for a female egg. Collection of cells, corona radiata, and this thick, almost fluid-like membrane called the zona pellucida. And the sperm cell is going to have to get through both those layers before it could finally reach the egg cell. And it gets weird afterwards. Because you, you got to go back to this picture. You got to remember, in a, a small amount of semen, there's lots of sperm cells. So when we talk about sperm cells making the journey up the uterus to get to the uterine tube, it's millions of them. And they will all reach the egg almost at the same time. And they will begin to burst their acrosomes, release their acrosomal enzymes, break down the corona radiata in an attempt to penetrate the egg cell, fertilize the egg cell. But only one sperm cell can make it into the egg. So how is it that only one cell makes it and not all of them? Well, it's a chemical reaction that occurs once the first sperm cell enters the, the female's egg. As Soon as the first sperm cell enters the egg, the rest of the zona pellucida that's left will harden, yeah. And once it hardens, that will prevent any extra sperm cells from possibly fertilizing the egg again, because that's, that's not helpful. The whole point of having the sperm cell meet the egg cell is to get their DNA to combine, get those nuclei to combine, combine DNA, and form you, your full set of DNA. So if you could imagine, if more than one sperm cell penetrated the egg, you would have too much DNA, and that's no good. So, in order to prevent that from happening, you'll have a natural reaction in which the rest of the zona pellucida would harden and prevent other sperm cells from penetrating the egg. And the one sperm cell that did, well, its nucleus, now called the male pronucleus, that's just the name, and we name everything. The male pronucleus is just the name of the sperm cell's nucleus once it has met the egg. And it will co combine with the female's egg's nucleus. We call that one the female pronucleus. They will fuse together to form your resulting nucleus holding your resulting DNA. And at the end of fertilization, after the sperm cell has penetrated the egg cell, you just have a single cell now. Again, I'm just going to show pictures. Here we go. That's what we're showing here in this picture. So I see two nuclei in the beginning. I'm seeing the nucleus from the sperm cell. That's the male pronucleus. And I'm seeing the nucleus from the female's egg cell. That's the female pronucleus. They will combine, and then you'll have just a single cell. That's you. Oh, look at you. Oh, you're not, look at that cute little baby right there. Oh, it's not a baby. You're called a zygote. That's you as a single cell organism right after fertilization. So how do I go from being a single cell to a full-blown adult made up of many cells? Well, you're going to have to begin to divide. This single cell is going to begin to divide into many cells. This division is what we call cleavage. Okay, I'm going, sorry, I went a little forward. So after fertilization, you're just a single-celled zygote. All right, and that zygote 
is going to have to form many cells. It has to form you. And it's going to take a while to do it. It takes a while to form a human. You also probably know how long it takes to form a human. Uh, think about pregnancy. Pregnancy is the process of developing a person, developing your offspring. And it occurs in the female uterus. So just FYI, no, you're not developing your baby in your tummy. I know when females talk to children about how babies develop, they're like, oh, the baby's in my tummy. But when people say tummy, they mean stomach. Here, you're not developing your baby in your stomach. It's happening in the uterus. And it takes a while. Oh, how long does a female have to stay pregnant or hopefully should stay pregnant if she doesn't have an early delivery? It's nine months. Okay, it takes about nine months. That's about 38 weeks for you to develop a person. And it all starts off as that single-celled zygote. Okay. You might have heard the terms trimesters. Um, you talk to a, fe a pregnant female, she usually will tell you, oh, I'm in my first trimester or my second trimester or my third trimester. That's just us breaking up those nine months into three-month blocks. So the first three months is your first trimester, second three months is your second trimester, and the third three months is your third trimester. That's your full nine-month period. And during this time, during these nine months, you're in your prenatal period, okay, before birth, basically. So let's see what happens in your prenatal period. What's happening during these nine months? Well, again, this is anatomy. We're just naming you at different stages of development. It's all about the timing. During your first eight weeks of development, you're in your embryonic stage. You're called an embryo. You're developing things like your internal organs. You're developing the placenta to help you to get oxygen and nutrients from your mom, as well as some of supporting structures as well. And you're going to get all of these structures starting off with a zygote. Okay. This zygote is going to begin to divide, split into cells. This splitting, this division is called cleavage, to cleave something means to break it into pieces. So you can imagine you're breaking this zygote up into different pieces. And those pieces are cells. And they get smaller and smaller the more you divide. Again, go into a picture, I'll come back. That's what we're seeing. You start off as this larger zygote, and with every cleavage phase, every time it divides, it divides into smaller and smaller cells. Until you get to this big cluster of cells. Around four days after fertilization, four days after you're conceived, you're nothing more than a solid ball of cells. And we're going to name that. Around day four, you're no longer called a zygote. You're called a marula. Go back to the previous slide. Here we go. A marula, about day four after your conception, you're just a solid mass, a solid ball of cells. And we even know how many cells are in this solid ball. It's only about 16 cells. Okay. So you originally, just four days ago, were just one single cell, a zygote. And then after that, you're now 16 cells, a solid mass. We call you a marula. And all of this is occurring in the uterine tube. That's what this picture is showing us. If we look down here, you're starting off, the mom releases the egg during ovulation, and then the sperm cell will meet it in the uterine tube. You'll have fertilization. And then you'll begin the process, going from zygote, splitting, doing cleavage until you're a marula, all the way making your way through that uterine tube back to get into the uterine cavity. And then once the marula makes it into the uterine cavity, it just kind of sits there for a couple days, kind of sitting in the cavity, not attaching to anything. So anywhere from about three to four days, it'll just sit in the uterine cavity, still developing. And then around day seven, it'll implant itself into the innermost layer of the uterus. Remember, we call that the endometrium. That's what you're seeing here. So about a week after conception, you're now or something else, and it's going to be embedded into the uterine wall, 
into the endometrium of the uterus. And I told you, you're going to be something else. Uh-oh. The marula is just sitting in the uterine cavity. But once you continue developing, oh, you're going to be something else. Go back here. Turns out you're going to form a hollow center. That originally solid ball is all of a sudden going to have a hollow center. And now you're going to have a different name. You're going to be called a blastocyst. So it's all stages of development. First, you're a single-celled zygote. Then you're a 16-cell solid mass called a marula. Give it a couple more days. You'll have a hollowed-out center, and we'll now call you a blastocyst. And it's the blastocyst that's going to embed itself in the endometrium of the uterus. And it all happens by the end of day seven, after your first week. And if you're wondering, what are these cells that I currently am? What are these cells in the blastocyst? These are all stem cells. Okay? These are the cells that will become all the different tissues and organs and structures of your body. Remember, stem cells can become anything. And these specific ones are the ultimate stem cells. They're called pluripotent stem cells. These can become other stem cells. Some we've seen, like the basal cells in your skin or the osteogenic cells in your bone. They were originally pluripotent stem cells. And they were a part of your blastocyst phase. So that's your first week of your existence. Okay. You're just a collection of cells with a hollowed out center. You're a blastocyst. That's what this little circle, this round structure is over here to the right where my mouse is. You're just a hollowed out mass uh, in the collection of cells called a blastocyst. And you would embed yourself into the lining of the uterus of your mom. Oh, but we got to keep going. Oh. We got to talk about that implantation after you kind of stick to the surface, <coughs> excuse me, so to speak, of the uterine wall. What happens next? Oh, we got to keep going. Turns out that blastocyst again will continue to develop, forming more cells, and then you're going to see some organization begin to occur. Cells will organize, meaning they'll come together you'll see what's called an embryoblast. When we look inside the blastocyst, we'll see some cells have clustered together. And we'll call this cluster of cells an embryoblast. This will give rise to your physical body. Let me show you a picture. Here we go. So here's our blastocyst I'm in this top picture. I see the hollowed out center. But now you see in this collection of cells have gathered together inside of the blastocyst. This is your embryoblast. This will become your physical body. And you can see it's only these, these cells on the inside. What about these cells on the outside? These cells surrounding the embryoblast, kind of forming the walls to the blastocyst, these are called the trophoblast cells. These cells are doing the embedding into the lining of the uterus. And if you notice, look at this bottom picture. This trophoblast will send extensions deep into the uterine, uterine wall. We gotta go back. We gotta talk about that. Here we go. So now you're a blastocyst, but we name the collection of cells in the blastocyst. The cells on the inside, aka the inner mass cells, those are your embryoblasts. That will be your body. But then there's the cells surrounding it, the trophoblast. These will provide the supporting structures for your developing body. Think things like the placenta, your amnion, which is a membrane surrounding you where we'll find embryonic fluid, amniotic fluid. The supporting structures are going to come from the trophoblast. And it's the trophoblast that's embedding or invading the innermost lining of the uterus, the endometrium. And it does it literally by sending cellular extensions, aka microvilli, into the uterus. Yeah. Okay. And we call this process of embedding yourself in the uterus implantation. Okay. 
And that's all we're seeing in this picture. You're seeing implantation occur. You're seeing the trophoblast cells send microvilli, send extensions into the uterine wall. And that's all this slide had to tell me. I'll keep going. Along the way, again, you're always going to need some help. And for development, again, that help is going to be hormones. Turns out those cells forming the trophoblast, they make a hormone. What do we see before? Human chorionic gonadotropin. Think back to endocrine system. I kind of mentioned when we did endocrine system, we saw hormones come from non-endocrine based uh, structures. We saw it coming from the placenta when we talked in endocrine system. But I just mentioned the placenta comes from the trophoblast. So it's really the trophoblast cells that are making human chorionic gonadotropin, HCG. And you only make HCG when you have a trophoblast. And you only have a trophoblast if you're pregnant. This is the hormone we look for in pregnancy tests. Remember, I told you, by the end of this class, I got to give you a baby doctor degree. Because you know a lot about what I know. The reason why doctors look for this hormone in your pregnancy tests is that is because we know it comes from structures that you only have if you're pregnant. Yeah. And there's a reason for it. There's a reason for this hormone. Turns out it helps to keep structures around. Structures that would help to maintain the pregnancy. Make sure that embryo develops and you don't lose it. Mainly the corpus luteum. Remember, that was the name of, of the follicle where we found the oocyte. Remember, after you have ovulation, the follicle becomes the corpus luteum, which itself makes hormones to help maintain pregnancy. It's all about maintaining the pregnancy. And then when that trophoblast finishes developing into a placenta, that placenta will continue to make HCG. Why? Because you can need to continue to maintain the pregnancy. And in addition to making hormones, your placenta has another function. It's literally to feed you. You'll exchange nutrients between yourself and your mom using the placenta. That's why you have one. Why? Because you'll see during your development, you're surrounded by liquid. You don't breathe, but your cells still need oxygen and nutrients. And you'll simply get it directly from your mother's blood, thanks to exchanges of blood or gases, nutrients, in the placenta. That's a little bit on implantation. That's how you kind of embed yourself into the innermost lining of the uterus. And then after you've implanted yourself, after you've attached or invaded yourself into the endometrium, you need to form the, those supportive structures. Okay. You need to form the placenta and some other structures, something called the chorion, something called the amnion, and the amniotic fluid. Oh, we got to talk about that. What is that? What is chorion? What is amnion? What is amniotic fluid? Well, Again, it's just us forming from those supportive layers. Remember, trophoblast is going to become many things. And all the things it's going to become are supportive structures to help you develop. One of those things the trophoblast will become, in addition to being the placenta, is something called the chorion. It's just a membrane that will surround you. And that is the chorion. And it's the chorion that's really going to develop into the placenta. So, like always, we're going in stages. You'll first form trophoblast within your uh, blastocyst. And then the trophoblast will develop into a layer of membrane called the chorion. And this chorion is sending extensions deeper into the linings of the uterus. And these extensions are what we call chorionic villi. After they invade the layers of the uterus, they're going to get surrounded by blood. By blood from the mother, maternal blood. This is the beginning to the development of the placenta. Let me show pictures. I always think that makes more sense. I'll come back to this slide. Here we go. So you've implanted yourself and you, the endometrium will literally surround you. So you're like in a little blanket of endometrium here. 
and this outermost layer of you, those are your trophoblast cells still surrounding you, and they'll form, literally become the chorion. So they kind of drew a circle around this outermost layer. That is your trophoblast, but we now call it the chorion. And they send little extensions out. Kind of looks like little arms sticking out all around it. These extensions are the chorionic villi. And they will invade deeper and deeper into the uterus and get surrounded by blood. And literally form blood vessels, which will become parts of your placenta. This is the placenta forming. It started out as the chorion, which came from your trophoblast. And how long does this take? It takes a while for your trophoblast to develop into the chorion and send out those extensions called chorionic villi. It takes about four weeks. And once those villi penetrate, I told you they will get surrounded by maternal blood and finally develop further, forming true blood vessels within what's now called the placenta. You're going to notice as we're going through this lecture, I'm going to skip some things. I'm not going to mention everything, so I'm not going to mention the connecting stock. When you get your final exam review, uh, you'll see what I want you to know from this chapter. Trust the review like all the other ones. Okay, so if I say skip this, you don't need to know it. I promise. I will not ask. I will not ask about the connecting stock. Why? Because we got other things to talk about. Let's keep going. I'm sorry, my slide is messing up again and not advancing. Give me a second. So now onto this slide. Okay. So we saw in our previous slide that your chorion will help to develop the placenta, but it also develops other supporting structures. Okay. Here's one I mentioned earlier. It's the amnion and amniotic fluid. Turns out they will also come from the from the chorion as well. And they'll they'll develop before the placenta is done developing. Turns out your amnion will form about around your second week of development. And it's going to attach to your inner mass cells, you, your body, all now at this point called the embryonic disc, because you're going to begin to look more like a flat pancake, like a flat disc. And this amnion will be a membrane surrounding you. And it will fill up with fluid. And we call that fluid amniotic fluid. It's coming from the amnion. So these cells forming the amnion will also make a fluid called amniotic fluid. And there's a reason, <coughs> excuse me, you'll be, <coughs> I'm so sorry, you'll be surrounded by this fluid. There's a reason for amniotic fluid. It's like a cushion. You've seen by now, most fluids in your body provide cushioning. Same thing for this fluid. And it'll provide cushioning to protect you from literal movements occurring in your mom's body. And it also does some other weird things. It even helps you to maintain a nice steady temperature. So if your mom's getting overheated, hot, or too cold, hopefully you won't feel those temperature changes because you get a little bit of insulation from this amniotic fluid. What else? In addition to forming amniotic fluid, this amnion would send little projections to form parts of your umbilical cord. Yeah. Well, the cord that connects you to the placenta. That is the umbilical cord. And it's made from the amnion. Again, let me show pictures. It'll make more sense. So here's the original picture showing your chorion sending out... Um, chorionic villi, which will further extend and form true blood vessels, which will become parts of your placenta. But closer to your physical body, you'll have membranes surrounding you, one of which is the amnion. 
and it'll create a fluid surrounding you called amniotic fluid. And it'll also send projections to help form the umbilical cord to attach you to blood vessels in your placenta. And that's all those previous slides were telling us. Well, we got other supporting structures to form. There's two additional structures that are going to be needed to help you to develop. There's something called the yolk sac and something called the allantois. Let me show you what they look like, then I'll talk about what they do. You see, I see them both here. They're in yellow on this picture. So yes, parts of them will go through the umbilical cord because they're going to supply things for your body. One of these little yellow filled sacs is called the allantois. The larger of the two is called the yolk sac. They both have a role. Turns out your yolk sac is going to help you to form some of your blood cells. Yeah, including your sex cells. So if you're a male, it's going to help you form sperm. If you're a female, it's going to be where you're going to be able to form egg cells. That allantois will also help you to form blood cells as well as well as blood vessels in the umbilical cord. So these are all supportive structures for you, mainly helping you to do the function of exchanging gases with the placenta. For you to exchange gases with the placenta, it has to go from blood cell to blood cell. So you'll have blood cells from your mom entering into the placenta, which will drop off or exchange oxygen, nutrients, carbon dioxide with the blood cells you are now forming in your own body. Yeah. So these are all parts of, of your supportive structures, helping to supply oxygen and nutrients in which you will develop. Don't worry about your decidual black, uh, basal. It's not going to ask that. Okay. Trust your exam review when it comes out for your final exam. This is showing a zoomed up picture of what it looks like inside of the placenta. Placenta's main job, we kind of mentioned a couple times, is just to exchange these things. Nutrients, waste even, um, and gases, oxygen and carbon dioxide. So it's going to be crammed filled with blood vessels because it's really the blood that's doing the exchanging. And you'll send these blood vessels through the um, umbilical cord to get to your umbilicus to help you deliver those oxygen and nutrients to your cells or pick up and deliver waste. Same thing here. This is a zoomed in picture, again, showing those extensions of the chorion, those chorionic villi. They'll get surrounded by blood and eventually form true blood vessels that will go up into the umbilical cord. Look at that. It took a lot of small structures to help you to form. And a lot of these structures will form within the first month of your development. And at which point you can continue on your journey of development. Oh, you gotta form organs. Uh oh. The process of forming your organs is called organogenesis, it's how you form your organs. And I've kind of mentioned this in some of our chapters, dealing with when you are a flat pancake. Yeah. At this point, we're about a month into development, okay? And you're a flat pancake made up of three layers. There's ectoderm, the outermost layer. Mesoderm, the middle or middle layer. And endoderm, the innermost layer. Let me show you a picture. Oh, go back. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I thought I had a picture. Uh, you're ba basically a flat pancake. Or maybe if you want, think of Oreo cookie made up of three layers. Outermost layer, ectoderm, middle layer, mesoderm, and innermost layer, endoderm. You've kind of talked about this when we did tissues. Remember, each of these layers will become the tissues of your body, which will develop into the organs of your body. And these three layers are what we call your, your embryonic germ layers or your primary germ layers. Okay. And you form these layers during a process called gastrulation. Okay. It's the movement of your cells in order to form these three layers. 
And it's called gastulation because when you form these layers, up oh, your name is going to be changed again. So let's keep track. You were originally a single cell zygote. Then you'll divide and form many cells into your 16 cell marula. Then you're going to develop an empty little pocket in the middle, call you a blastocyst. And then you're going to form your trophoblast layer and your inner mass cell layer and develop into a three uh, layered pancake we call a gastrula. So there's four names so far zygote, marula, blastocyst, and now you're called a gastrula. You're a flat pancake of three germ layers. Okay. I'm sorry, I'm going to keep kind of keep up with these names because I know it's kind of hard to keep up. We do remember this is anatomy. We name everything. We name you at different stages of your development. And in your gastrula phase, you're a flat pancake made up of three layers. Think back to tissues. These layers need to form the tissues of your body. And we only have four major groups of tissues. Connective tissue, epithelial tissue, muscle tissue, and nervous tissue. Turns out ectoderm typically forms your nervous tissue. So yes, it'll form parts of your nervous system, if not all of your nervous system. But it also helps to form parts of your skin, parts of your epidermis. Your mesoderm is going to form your connective tissue and your muscle tissue. So think muscles come from mesoderm. Think structures made up of connective tissue. They come from mesoderm. Remember blood, bone? Remember those are tissues that are specifically a type of connective tissue. They came from mesoderm. And your endoderm is going to form a lot of your epithelial tissues. And remember, we see epithelial tissues in lots of places, like simple columnar epithelium in your digestive system, or tr transitional epithelium in your bladder. Think epithelial tissues. They tend to come from endoderm. Right, so we're just naming you at different phases. Originally a single-celled zygote, then you'll become a multi-celled solid ball we call a marula. Then you'll have a hollowed out center. We call you a blastocyst. Then when you're that flat pancake, call you a gastrula. Cleavage is just the process of you dividing into many cells to form the marula. That's all this thing is doing. This, this table is doing. So after that first month, then what happens next? By the uh, your, your month of formation, you're going to begin or kind of continue, let's say continue to develop. Those three germ layers, endoderm, mesoderm, and ectoderm, I told you, you need to form your tissues, which will then become organs. And you'll have a lot of your internal organs before the second month is up. By what, about week seven, you'll have most of your internal organs. Yeah. And by the end of your second month, well, you're completing your embryonic stage. Remember, go way back to the beginning of this chapter. Remember when we talk about uh, your stages of development. Go back, go back. Um, so I'm just going back for definitions. Okay. We're still in the overall prenatal period. But during those first eight weeks, during those first eight, uh, uh, two months, you're an embryo. Then after those two first two months, you're no longer an embryo. You're leaving your embryonic stage. What comes next? Okay. So remember, by the time you're an embryo, about week eight, you have formed most of your internal organs and some external structures, like hands and the feet. And you, you're kind of beginning to look like a human, but not quite, not quite, okay? So this is what I mean when you're surrounded by membranes. You're seeing the amnion, that's this clear film surrounding the embryo, and it's filled with amni amniotic fluid. But then after the embryonic stage, after week eight, 
once you begin week nine, you're now in your fetal state. Because now you're called a fetus. Okay. So again, oh boy, your name has changed yet again. So start off in your embryonic stage. You're an embryo. Going from a zygote to a marula to a blastocyst to a gastrula. Then around week nine, you're now a fetus and you're in your fetal stage. This is the stage of rapid growth. Okay? Not so much development because you've done a lot of development in your first two weeks. First two weeks of your existence is a lot of development and happens rapidly. But afterwards, now the emphasis is going to be on growth, getting things to increase in size. Okay. And so that will be increases in size of all body structures, all right, including your limbs. They will just get bigger. And this will take time over a couple weeks, over the next month, so to speak. Okay. So by the end of your uh, third month, aka week 12, you've gotten bigger in size and we can now determine sex. So if you ever get pregnant or you know a female who's been pregnant, usually you can't tell the sex right away because you need to form your organs. Well, the penis is an organ. The vagina is an organ. You need time to form them. And you won't be done with organogenesis until about week eight. And they need to get bigger for us to see them. And that growth will occur over the next month. So usually by the end of your first trimester, it's week 12, you'll be able to tell if you're a male or female. The structures will have formed and be big enough for us to see them. Okay. Then what happens? What happens in the next trimester, the second trimester? The second trimester are these months here. During the second trimester, growth is going to slow a little bit. Okay. You're still growing, but you're going to slow a little bit. Why? Because you're going to do other things. You're going to begin to move. Oh, you got to first form your muscles before you can move them. And so usually around month five is when the mom will finally begin to feel the kicks of the fetus. Yeah. Why? Because you're beginning to move now. Then by month number six, you'll begin to gain weight and form other structures like your eyebrows and eyelids. Yeah, you don't have eyelids. Look back at those pictures. This baby does not have eyelids. I can see the eyes nice and easily. Okay. Yeah, you need time to form your eyelids. And that won't even happen until month six. When you're a preemie, you might hear the term preemie, premature babies. You can have preemies born as early as seven months. And that's dangerous because you're not done forming things. Yeah. You first need to form the eyelids. Then to open the eyelids doesn't occur until month seven. So you can imagine if you have a preemie born at month seven, they might have some visual problems because they might not have been done forming the eyes and the eyelids to protect them. Yeah. This, this is why premature birth is so dangerous. You're not done forming everything almost up until the very end when you're, when you're uh, at month nine. Yeah. Why? Why is it so dangerous? Because the brain, oh, it turns out the brain needs to grow too. And it won't begin to grow really until the last trimester. Yeah. And finally, when you're done with your last trimester, you're considered full term. You got to make it to the last month, all nine months to be considered full term. Why? You got to give that baby time to grow all those, those structures, finish maturing all the structures. Yeah. Form that human. It takes time. And by the end of the nine months, you'll look more familiar to us. Oh, that's now looking like a baby. Don't call it a baby yet. This is still a fetus. You're not going to be called a baby until after you're born. So you're an embryo first, made up of a zygote, marula, blastocyst, gastrula. Then you'll become a fetus, growing and finishing off the formation of your organs. And then after birth, you could be called a baby. Remember, this is anatomy. We're very specific on our names. 
And along the way, you're going to need help. You're going to need oxygen and nutrients. You get them from the placenta. Why? Because you're surrounded by amniotic fluid. I know it doesn't show it in here, but there is amniotic fluid surrounding this baby. This baby is floating in fluid right now. So it doesn't make sense for this kid to breathe. Why? Because if they try, they're just going to inhale fluid into their lungs. So when you're a fetus, you're not breathing yet. Remember, you're getting all your oxygen and nutrients from the placenta into the placenta, uh, you know, umbilical cord to go to your body. So it doesn't really make sense to breathe. Okay. And so because of that, oh, we got to talk about delivering the oxygen because it's not going to be coming from the lungs. It's coming from the placenta and those blood vessels in the umbilical cord. The blood vessels responsible for transporting the oxygen and the nutrients to the fetus are your veins. They're the umbilical veins. They deliver the oxygen and nutrients. There are umbilical arteries, but they're more to get the waste. Okay. People get this kind of confused because we want to think about our adult bodies, our non-baby bodies. Us adults, our arteries are delivering the oxygen and nutrients. But this is not a typical blood vessel. These are umbilical blood vessels. Okay, so in the umbilicus, in the umbilical cord, the umbilical vein, it's what's delivering the oxygen and nutrients. And when it delivers the oxygen and nutrients, turns out it's being carried to a specific part of this fetus's body. Turns out it's being carried to the liver, yeah. And once it gets to the liver, it's not gonna go into the liver because there's no need. The whole point of your liver as an adult is to filter and process out things in your blood, but you don't need to process anything because it's been done for you by your mom and your placenta. So when this blood arrives at the liver, it's gonna be shunted away. It's gonna bypass the inner structures of the liver Thanks to a vessel we call the ductus venosus. It's going to send this oxygen rich blood directly to your inferior vena cava, which will then send it to your heart so your heart can pump it to the rest of your body. Okay. And that's all that's going on. And once you're in the heart, oh boy, we got to even talk about that. You know the pathway of blood through the heart from when we did cardiovascular system, circulatory system. Remember, blood goes from the right atrium to the right ventricle, then into your pulmonary trunk, then pulmonary arteries, until it gets to the lungs, so you can pick up oxygen. But I told you, this baby doesn't breathe. These fetuses don't breathe. So there's no point of sending blood to the lungs. So in addition to bypassing the liver, thanks to the ductus phenosis, you also need to bypass the lungs because there's no point in sending blood to the lungs because you're not breathing. It already has oxygen in it. So in your heart, you need to bypass the, the lungs. And the way you do it is by not sending blood into the right ventricle. When blood enters the right atrium, it should not send blood into the right ventricle. Why? Because we know the right ventricle sends blood to the lungs, but these aren't breathing, these are fetuses. So after the right atrium, you're gonna skip the right ventricle and instead send the blood to the left atrium. And you could do that thanks to a tiny hole between the left and right atrium called the foramen valve. It's a tiny hole in the atrial septum, the wall between the left and right atrium. That way you don't have to send the blood into the right ventricle and into the lungs because you're not breathing. Okay. But let's say, let's say some blood does get into the right ventricle. This isn't perfect. Okay. Your heart beats with a strong force. It's going to send most of the blood through the foramen valve. But yes, some does make it into the right ventricle. Oh, don't worry, though. You got a backup system. You got another bypass track. Okay. Remember, right after the right ventricle, you're going to send blood into the pulmonary trunk. And that's where you're going to find a second bypass system, another path. It's 
It's called the ductus arteriosus. This allows you to send blood from the pulmonary trunk to the aorta. So you could skip the lungs again because you're not breathing. And then after you get into the aorta, you know the rest. You'll go send the blood to the rest of the body. So in a fetus who's not breathing because they're surrounding it by amniotic fluid, they'll send blood from the right atrium to the left atrium, which will then send the blood to the left ventricle and into the aorta. And if any blood gets into the right ventricle, it will go to the pulmonary trunk, but then go through the ductus arteriosus to again get to the aorta. Skip the lungs. You're not breathing. Okay. And you remember the umbilical arteries are getting the waste. They're picking up waste and taking it away from your fetus body. So that's fetal circulation. And that's what we're seeing in this picture. Let me zoom in. Let's start off again with the placenta using your umbilical cord to carry arteries and veins. The arteries are carrying deoxygenated blood and waste away from the fetus's body. So the umbilical arteries are blue. Okay, I know it's confusing. We know arteries in our adult bodies are red, veins are blue. But in the baby, or not the baby, the fetus's body, the arteries are blue because they're carrying deoxygenated blood away from the fetus while the veins are red because they're carrying oxygenated blood to the fetus. And I told you, it's going to go to the liver, but there's no point of sending it directly into the liver because the blood has already been processed by the mom's liver and the placenta. So you will bypass it with a little tube right here to send it directly into the inferior vena cava. That's called the ductus venosus. Skip the liver. And that inferior vena cava will dump the blood off in the right atrium. And you remember from right atrium, you'll pass through a tiny hole to enter the left atrium. You'll pass through that foramen ovale. And then after left atrium, into left ventricle and into the aorta to send it around the body. But oh, sometimes, yep, you send blood from right atrium to right ventricle, which will then go into the pulmonary trunk. We got our second bypass. This little tube right here. Remember, that's called the ductus arteriosus. It allows you to send blood from the pulmonary trunk to the aorta. Because, again, there's no point of sending blood to the lungs. You're not breathing. So that's a little bit on how this developing person, this developing fetus, is getting its oxygen and nutrients and getting rid of waste. Now you know. These next couple slides talk about changes we're going to see in the mom's hormones during the pregnancy. Uh, you don't need to know this. Okay, We've already kind of talked about hormones in endocrine system. And a lot of the hormone changes that occur in the mom, we already know because they're based off the developing structures. Like we already know your trophoblast cells and the chorion and the resulting placenta are making human chorionic chorionic gonadotropin to maintain the pregnancy. We already know sperm cells are going to get help from estrogen, kind of loosening up those uterine secretions to help the sperm cell make it. So we don't, we're not going to talk about these uh, hormone changes in pregnancy. So we're going to skip these next couple slides. Don't need to know these hormone changes during pregnancy. Okay. This is still dealing with hormone changes during pregnancy. Skip all that. So we've gotten through your development from single-celled um, zygote all the way up to this multi-organ fetus. And after you're done, after week number 38, aka month nine, you're ready to be born. Oh, you got to talk about the process of birth. You already know. You already know this process way back from chapter one. Way back from when we did homeostasis, okay? Now think back to positive and negative feedback. Remember I gave an example for positive feedback. Remember that was childbirth, it's labor. It's a type of positive feedback. Think back to chapter one, let's talk about that. 
Remember, positive feedback is when your body likes a change and it wants more. It's when you increase or exaggerate the initial stimulus. Okay. And during childbirth, the initial stimulus is the birth itself. It is the child coming out. And for the female body, that sounds like a good thing because we saw that baby is sucking all the life out of you via all these blood vessels and the placenta. So for this, yeah, it's kind of like a parasite to be leaving. That's a good thing for the female's body. So we'll treat birth as a positive feedback. We know how. Think back to chapter one. Remember, at first, first, how does the female's body know the birth is occurring? Well, the baby spontaneously comes out. Birth is a spontaneous thing. When's the last time you heard a female say, labor, activate? It doesn't work like that. Okay. It's a spontaneous process where the baby begins to descend from the uterus. But how does the female's body know when the baby's coming out? Oh, oh it turns out. When that baby comes out, it pushes on the walls of the uterus and causes the uterus to stretch. And you remember, there's going to be receptors that notice the stretching in the uterus. And it's going to trigger the brain to release a hormone called oxytocin. Think back to chapter one. Remember, oxytocin does a couple things, two major things. One of which is to increase the frequency and the force of uterine contractions. Increase the force of the contractions in the muscle of the uterus. And this will end up speeding the process, speeding up the process of the baby coming out. We knew that all from chapter one. That wasn't new, okay? And that's how you're gonna get the baby out. It's really oxytocin. Once the stretching occurs, the brain will release oxytocin, causing the muscle in the uterus to contract and push the baby out. Yeah. That's why when we say a female's having contractions, it's literally that, it's a muscle contraction. Yeah, it's muscle movement, moving to get the baby out. She can increase the force by straining and using some abdominal muscles, but it's mainly the uterine muscles that's doing all the work. And this muscle is smooth muscle, so she doesn't control it. That's why females do not control when they have contractions, because the contractions are literally muscle contractions, smooth muscle contractions in the walls of the uterus. And you'll, you'll have to literally deliver two things. TV usually just shows us delivering one thing. TV makes it seem like baby comes out, oh, labor is done. Oh, no, it's not. Okay, you got to deliver two things. You got to deliver the baby and the placenta. Okay, so if you've actually ever seen a true life delivery, oh, you got to push two things out. Get the baby out and get the placenta out. Oops, sorry. Okay. And the placenta gets a name after it's been expelled, after it's been pushed out. It's called the afterbirth. People like to use that term a lot. Afterbirth. What's afterbirth? It's just the placenta that's just come out. Now you know. If you didn't know, yeah, females got to push two things out. The fetus, now called a baby after it's been delivered, and the placenta or the afterbirth after it's been delivered. Now you know. And I told, I mentioned earlier, it all kind of helped, uh, got the help with from oxytocin. Remember I told you it did two things. One of which is increasing the force and the frequency of uterine contractions. But it's also helping after delivery. Uh -oh. What needs to happen after delivery? After you give birth to a baby, you then gotta feed the baby. Uh oh. You're going to have to breastfeed the baby. And in order to breastfeed the baby, you need to do two things. Uh-oh, as a female. You need to make your milk, and then you need to release the milk. Oxytocin will help you to release the milk. You can call it milk ejection, sometimes called milk let down. That's you releasing the milk, feeding your baby. That's the job of oxytocin. And you'll release oxytocin here when the baby begins to suckle on the breast. 
when you manipulate the breast or the nipple specifically, that will trigger the release of oxytocin and tell the breast tissue to release the milk, eject the milk. So sometimes you might hear this if you've ever been around a female or are, are the female who's given birth and you haven't been able to breastfeed the baby or like the, the milk's not coming out. You'll hear the doctor say this. It's going to sound weird. Your doctor's not trying to be kinky. They're just knowing anatomy. They'll tell you to stimulate the, the nipples. They squeeze the nipples. Okay, why? That's mimicking the suckling of the baby, and that will trigger your brain to release oxytocin, so your breast tissue will release the milk. Yeah. But you'll only release the milk after you've made the milk. You first need to make the milk. And yes, your breast tissue needs to be told to produce the milk. And it's going to be told to do it by a different hormone. Oh, yeah. It's called prolactin. Kind of gives you a hint of the name. Lactin for lactation, which is the process of milk production. Prolactin tells your breast tissue to produce milk. And then oxytocin will tell your breast tissue to release the milk. All right. <clears throat> so now you know. So that's all this picture is showing. It's just showing us milk being produced in the glands of the breast tissue and being ejected via the ducts. So you've made it through your development all the way through birth and even getting fed after you're born. And now we're um, in, the, in the neonatal period. Okay. This is the overall post-fetal um, post period. Okay, so you're no longer a fetus, you're born now. But in the first four weeks, aka the first month of your, your existence, your life, after birth, you're in your neonatal period. Okay, you're a newborn. That's your neonatal period. Okay. And during this period, oh, you still need some help. Okay. During this period, some organs need to kind of finish off developing. Yeah, still, still. And in order for that to happen, some cells need to die. Oh boy, yeah. In the beginning of your life, you're experiencing some minor deaths. And the deaths are in your cells. It's a programmed cell death we call apoptosis. And that's literally the definition. Apoptosis is programmed cell death. You're specifically telling cells to die. And the reason why is to finish shaping your organs. Okay. Some of your organs when you're born are very solid structures and to finish shaping them, you need to kill off some cells so they get their unique shapes. So you'll have some, some apoptosis. Yeah. Okay. What else? Well, once you're born, you now need to breathe. Oh, remember before you were born, you were getting your oxygen and nutrients from the placenta and your umbilical blood vessels. Well, now that you're born, oh, it's now on you. You need to breathe now. And again, you're going to need some help. Your lungs are going to need some help. Because when you first form the lungs, they're kind of stiff. But for you to breathe in and out, to inhale, your lungs need to expand. To exhale, your lungs need to collapse. For you to breathe, your lungs need to be flexible. And they're going to get help in getting flexible from a chemical called surfactant. Okay. Surfactant will help your, your lungs to become flexible so they can expand and collapse with each breath. And you won't even begin to make surfactant until you're almost born, or around the first, or not first, the uh, last couple days of your development in the womb. So think month nine, you're still not quite ready to breathe. Not until almost ready to be born does your body begin to make surfactant. So you remember, this is going to be a problem if you're born prematurely. Let's say you're born in month eight. You're not making surfactant. A lot of preemies, when you look at videos, are always put on a ventilator. It's for this one fact. You haven't made surfactant yet. Yeah. This is why newborns, premature newborns, are put on ventilators. It's literally their lungs are too stiff 
Why? Because they haven't made surfactant. Yeah. That's why you got to try your best as much as possible to last out the full nine months. Yeah. I know things happen. We can always do it, but preemies do get born, but if at all possible, make it to that nine months. Your baby needs all that time to develop. Now you know. And remember, it's going to take time for the breast tissue to make milk and for you to release it. I told you, some moms are have delivered babies and cannot release the milk yet. Well, hopefully, your baby won't starve to death. Why? Babies are born chunky. Oh. When you see newborns, they're chunky little babies. You, you don't see a lean, muscular baby getting born. It's for a reason. Your babies are literally being born, kind of giving you time to release the milk. Turns out all that fat on that little chunky baby will hopefully help keep them alive for the first couple days. About the first two days after birth, they can live off the fat of their body until their mom's milk comes in. But that doesn't mean they're out of any danger. Just because they're living off fat is not a good thing. They could die from dehydration. Okay, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so that's, a, that's about it, about your development. You now know what happens. Oh, what about those bypass tracts? Well, remember, before you weren't breathing, so we had the ductus venosus and ductus arteriosus to skip the liver and the lungs. But then you start breathing. What happens to all those bypass tracts? They will literally close up. Remember, there's the ductus venosus to skip the liver. Well, once you're born and you're breathing, you now need to send the blood to the liver. You don't need to skip it anymore. So that ductus venosus will constrict. It will close up. Huh. You're now breathing, so you don't need to skip the lungs. So what about that foramen ovale between the left and right atrium? That will close also. And don't forget the ductus arteriosus, allowing you to send blood from the pulmonary trunk to the aorta. You don't need it anymore because you're breathing. Close it. You know, all these structures should close. Yes, and some kids, they stay open and they'll possibly need medicine to help force them to close or even surgery in extreme cases. Yeah. Why? Because you're breathing. It's important to make sure you send blood to the lungs to pick up the oxygen because you no longer have a placenta to deliver it for you. Okay. And it takes a while. It's not always immediately. It can happen very quickly. It can happen within minutes after birth. But in some kids, it could take up to a year for certain for structures to close, like the foramen ovale. Okay. Don't need to know about fetal hemoglobin. But those are the changes. Then you'll experience your life as a kid. Going from infancy through childhood, adolescence, adulthood. At this point, people typically know, know what happens. During infancy, you're a baby. And what happens with babies? Well, they're going to grow. They should gain weight. Uh, they'll begin to form teeth and bite you and you'll scream and they'll bite even harder because they think it's funny. Yep, little babies are, are mean. <laughs> don't, get a, don't let a baby bite you. It hurts. Then they'll enter toddler stage with the terrible twos and then the threes. All right. Still growing along the way. Okay. And their toddlerhood, they'll begin to do things like walking, running. They'll punch you. They'll still bite you. Okay. They have teeth. Yeah. And their little toddlerhood, they'll begin to talk to you. As they get a little older, a little older child, they'll begin to read and write. Then you'll enter adolescence, aka puberty. Well, you'll go through sexual maturation, developing secondary sex characteristics. Remember for males, that's things like a deeper voice, growth spurts, thickening of muscles. For females, it's also a deepening of voice, growth spurs. Uh, but you also things, see things like breast development, the beginning of a menstrual cycle. That's all during adolescence. 
And adolescence extends into early adulthood. Yes, you're not done with puberty on average until your your late teens, early 20s. Yeah. And then after that, you'll enter adulthood, where things kind of stay stable for a while. But oh, we know what's coming. We're getting older, so our cells are going to begin to die. Turns out, for example, you'll have m your peak muscle strength usually in your 20s. This is why athletes tend to retire in their 30s. It's because their cells have literally gotten old. Are they still fast? Yes. But are they as fast as they used to be? No. Oh, okay. Yes, and you may even, when you hit your 30s, see your height decrease. Again, that's just cells. Even the cells in your bone get old and die. You might see that as a decrease in your height. Yeah, and it can happen as early as your 30s. Remember, every, we know by now things go down the drain when we get older. So as you get older, yes, things aren't going to work as well as they used to, only because your cells don't work as well as they used to. And you are your cells. And then after adulthood, we actually give an end to adulthood. And we enter old age. We call that senescence. That's old age. Again, your cells are getting older, so you're going to begin to see a rapid decline in function if you're not maintaining a healthy lifestyle. Exercise, oh, I told you, you got to exercise practically your entire life. You got to eat healthy your entire life. Why? Because things are going down the drain, and it will be accelerated with an unhealthy lifestyle. So that's, that's basically your life in terms of anatomy. And then the second half of this lecture is genetics. Okay, it's us talking about how do you pass on your genes, your inherited traits, your DNA. Okay. And when you pass off your DNA to your offspring, you're passing off everything, including the mistakes in your DNA. We call those mutations. Okay, they're, they're changes in the DNA that have usually will have results that aren't always the best. Okay, when, when we talk about mutations and anatomy, no, we're not talking about becoming an X-Man. You're not going to become Wolverine or Storm. No, you're more likely to get cancer and die. Okay, why? Because these are changes um, in your DNA, and they're not usually positive changes. But, but we got to talk about that. We got to talk about how do you pass on your DNA and any changes that might occur along the way. Okay. So we got to look at your DNA. When we look at DNA and genetics, we really look at your chromosomes. And for a human, you have 23 pairs of chromosomes, meaning you have 46 individual chromosomes. We say 23 pairs. This, and we look at it. We actually have pictures of our 23 chromo chromosome pairs. That's what you're seeing here. We give a name to this picture, this, this display of our 23 pairs of chromosomes. It's called a karyotype. I want you to know that definition. A karyotype is literally a display of your 23 pairs of chromosomes. And when we look at these chromosomes, there's 23 for a reason. They all carry some type of information. So we break them up into two major groups. There are what we call autosomes, and there's what we call sex chromosomes. Once you know the difference between your autosomes and your sex chromosomes. Your autosomes are the first 22 pairs of, of chromosomes. Okay. And these do not determine sex. That's going to be the job of the last pair, your 23rd set, is called your sex chromosomes. And they're called that because they're the chromosomes that determine if you're male or female. They're determining your sex. And you might know what these chromosomes are. They're different for males and females. If you're a female, when I look at your 23rd set, I should see two X chromosomes. They're the pair. Okay. If you're a male, I'll see an X and a Y chromosome. I want you to know that. Females, 
in their sex chromosomes have two X chromosomes, and males have an X and a Y chromosome. Yeah, only males have the Y chromosome, normally. Okay. So it's these things that we're passing on. When that male pronucleus and female pronucleus combine, you're taking half or 23 chromosomes from the male and 23 chromosomes from the female to combine to form you, who has the complete set. Okay. And we'll see traits within those chromosomes. A chromosome is your DNA. Remember, your DNA is the recipe book on how to make you, okay? And if it's the complete recipe book, let's say I wanted to make only one part of me. Let's say I wanted to have only a recipe. We call it a gene. A gene is a sequence of your DNA that tells you how to make one particular thing, like a protein. And when it comes to your genes, there's different versions. You have different variants, meaning versions. We call those alleles. Alleles are just variants, aka different versions of a gene. Okay, you're gonna about to hear a couple different definitions. For example, let me give you an example of what it means to be an allele. I told you there are different variations of a gene, different versions of a gene. For example, there's the gene that gives you your eye color. Okay, and we notice when we look around at other people. People come in different eye colors. And the reason why we can have different eye colors is because we have different versions of this eye color gene. There's the version that gives you brown eyes. There's a version that gives you blue eyes or hazel eyes, green eyes, etc. There are different alleles, different versions of genes. These are what you're passing on to your kids. It's the alleles, which are in your chromosomes. And when it comes to passing off alleles, oh, there's different alleles, there's different versions. Sometimes you could get two of the same version. You could get two identical alleles. I'm brown-eyed, for example. Maybe it's because I have two of the same brown eye allele. We give a name to when you have the same alleles. It's called being homozygous. Homo means the same. The same. Zygous as in zygote. You're a zygote with the same alleles. You're homozygous. But that's not always the case. You could get a mixture. Remember, you're made up of two individual people's cells that have come together. So maybe my mom gave me a brown eye allele, but my dad gave me a hazel eye allele. I could get different alleles from my parents. When you have different alleles, we call that heterozygous. Don't you know these terms? Same alleles, homozygous, different alleles, heterozygous. And we give a name to the combination of alleles. Oh boy, it's called your genotype. Think of your genotype as us writing out the alleles. That's what we're seeing on this page here. I'm seeing this capital A representing a, an allele and another A representing another allele. This is a written genotype. It's a representation of your alleles. And we'll see consequences of the alleles. I told you, I could have a, an allele giving me brown eyes or an allele giving me blue eyes. This physical representation of your genotype, aka of your alleles, is what we call your phenotype. It's your appearance. It's what we see. And it's the result of your genes. Okay. And some alleles are normal. Oh boy, when it comes to the variations of your genes, there are some normal ones and there are some abnormal ones. The normal alleles, what most people have are normal alleles, is what we call the wild type allele. It's what you find in the wild to keep you alive. It's the normal allele. But I told you people can have a mutation, okay? Where you change your DNA. And if you do, you'll change the variations of your genes. You'll change your alleles and possibly have an, un, an abnormal allele. Okay. We're just talking about definitions. Okay. Still talking about your alleles. 
So I told you, you can have different types of alleles. And so because there are different types, we're going to have to name them. There's really two major types of alleles we talk about. There's a dominant allele and a recessive allele. They have to deal with whether or not you're going to see a phenotypical representation. Is it going to be expressed? Meaning, am I going to see the phenotype for that allele? The dominant allele is the allele that gets expressed. It's what you're going to see in the phenotype. For example, if I get the brown-eyed allele and you're seeing I'm brown-eyed, it's likely because that allele is the dominant allele. It's what got expressed. But there's also a recessive allele. This is the allele that does not get expressed. Okay, so I told you I could possibly be brown eyed because I have a brown eye allele and a hazel eye allele. But do you see my eyes as hazel? Well, I know you can't see me, but I told you my eyes are brown. But if I have a hazel eye allele, it means that allele was not expressed. It means it was a recessive allele. Okay. We can literally predict what alleles we might be able to pass on to our offspring if we know our own alleles. I could determine what alleles I'll possibly pass off to my children using something called a Punnett square. Uh, that's what we see on this picture here. It's literally a square made up of a couple boxes depending on how many alleles you have. And it'll help you to predict the possible outcomes in your children. Yeah. That's what we're seeing here. I'm seeing the alleles up top, a capital A and a lowercase a, coming from the sperm cell of the dad. And I'm seeing the alleles, the capital A and, cap and lowercase a, coming from the egg, aka the oocyte, from the mom. And then in the Punnett square itself, I'm seeing the different combinations, the possible outcomes of the children. How do you fill out this Punnett square? Very simply, you fill in the alleles from each of the parents. So, and it fill it in for the column and the row that allele is in. So I see this capital A, I'll put it in this box, and I'll also put it in the box across from it, in the same row. For this capital A up top, I'll follow this column, put in my capital A here and the other capital A down here. And the same thing for the other letters. Here's this lowercase a, fill in the row that it's across from. So I see a lowercase and a lowercase. And then fill in this lowercase allele in this column here and here. That's how you fill in that Punnett square. And then the resulting allele combinations are the possible outcomes for the offspring. It doesn't guarantee your offspring will look like these alleles. It's just a possibility there'll be one of these. Okay. And, and that's how you, you fill out a pun in square. And so let's walk through this example. I kind of went through that kind of quickly. Let's double back. Let's go through what happened in this picture. So that example was showing skin color. Yes, your skin color is from your genes. Okay. Yes, you could get darker with sun exposure, but your skin color, how much melanin you have, is from your genes. It's from your parents from them passing their genes on to you. And when it comes to skin color, we have an allele. The normal allele is a capital A. This is the dominant allele. Dominant alleles are usually represented with a capital letter, recessive alleles with a lowercase letter. Okay. And I told you your skin color is due to melanin, a pigment in your skin. And normal allele to tell you to make melanin is the capital A allele. It's the dominant allele. But you don't necessarily have to make melanin. There are some people that lack melanin. Okay. This is represented as a lowercase a. Sorry, this is a typo. That should say lowercase a. Because it's representing the... Um, oh, there it is. It's representing the... Oh, still not getting it right. It's representing the recessive allele. There we go. It took me a minute to type that in. Right. Make the screen bigger again. There we go. 
So, so these are the different allele combinations. You can have the normal allele telling you to make melanin, or you can have the recessive allele telling you not to make melanin. Okay. And so there are possible combinations. You could possibly be homozygous dominant, meaning you have both the dominant alleles. You will normally, you will have a normal skin pigmentation for whatever your parents pass on to you. Or you could be heterozygous, meaning you have different alleles. I have the dominant and the recessive. That's what it means when they say different. It's not like it's a totally different thing. It's just, are you having a dominant and recessive combination? That's heterozygous. Or you could be homozygous recessive, where you have both the recessive alleles. You will see different phenotypes, different physical representations for each of these combinations. For example, when remember the dominant allele is always expressed. So I have, I have the dominant allele, doesn't matter if it's homozygous dominant or even heterozygous. I will have the normal expressed wild type allele. But if I have the recessive homozygous, I'll have that abnormal combination. In this case, it's saying you don't make melanin. So we call those people albinos. They don't have melanin. Why? Because they have the homozygous recessive version of this allele, which tells you not to make melanin. Usually heterozygotes are what we call carriers because they're carrying both the dominant and the recessive allele combinations, yeah. So let's say two heterozygous people came together and I wanted to know what's the chance of these two heterozygous skin colored individuals having an albino? That's where the Punnett square comes into play. So we'll fill it out. Here I have two parents that are heterozygous, male, I'm seeing the capital and the lowercase, heterozygous, female, capital in the lowercase, heterozygous. And I wanna know what's the possibility of them having an albino kid? Well, you'll fill out the Punnett square. And it gives us four possible combinations from the resulting uh, offspring. They can be homozygous dominant, having normal skin, heterozygous, having normal skin, or possibly an albino, homozygous recessive. There's a one in four chance, there's a 25% chance this couple will have an albino, only because they're of their genes. Their genes are telling me. This is how, how doctors are saying, oh, you need to be careful. There's a possibility that you and your, your partner may have a kid with such and such. They just looked at your DNA, ran a couple of Punnett Square exercises to see the probabilities, to see the percentages, the chances of you having certain gene combinations. It's not super science. It's literally fill in the box. Uh -oh. Now you know. And we gotta know this stuff because there's certain diseases we could pass on. There's certain diseases that are the result, for example, of having certain allele combinations, like cystic fibrosis. Cystic fibrosis is a pulmonary disease largely, but there also affects other things, but major complaints are pulmonary problems, lung problems. Okay. And this is the result of having abnormal alleles, having the recessive allele. You get cystic fibrosis when you're homozygous recessive for cystic fibrosis. So if you're a carrier for, for cystic fibrosis, meaning you have the dominant and recessive, there's a one in four chance if two heterozygous people come together, two carriers come together, they might have a cystic fibrosis child. There's also another one. Oh, there's some problems, yes, with the dominant alleles. An example is Huntington's disease. This tends to affect the brain, which will disrupt muscle coordination, okay, and also behavior, because it's affecting the brain. This is the result of being homozygous, or not even homozygous, could be homozygous dominant or heterozygous. This is because they have the dominant allele that causes Huntington's disease, yeah. So again, if you're, uh, 
if you have the dominant allele, period, it always gets expressed. Always remember it. If you have the dominant allele, the capital letter it will always get expressed. So you can imagine if someone has the dominant allele for Huntington's disease, doesn't matter if they're homozygous dominant or heterozygous, I see a capital letter. It will get expressed. They will have Huntington's disease. Most people don't have Huntington's disease. It's because most people have the recessive allele, which does not get expressed. So yeah, if you in this scenario, if you imagine these alleles were Huntington's disease, both these parents have it. Doesn't matter if you're a carrier or full-blown homozygous dominant. So if you can imagine, if two people that were heterozygous for Huntington's disease got together, what's the chance of their children having it? So one in or so three and four chance. All well, three of these have the capital A. They would have all been Huntington's disease patients. Every time this, these couples have a kid, there's a three in four chance they will have a kid with Huntington's disease like them. Okay. But it's a little complicated when it comes to passing on your genes. Why? It's not always straightforward like a Punnett square. There's always little um, mixes thrown in. All we got to talk about expressing our genes. What are the different things that can interfere with gene expression? I want you to know these different things that can interfere with gene expression. Codominance, incomplete dominance, polygenic inheritance, ooh, multiple allele inheritance, and something called pleiotropy. Let's talk about their impact on whether or not you will express allele, whether or not you will have a phenotype for that allele. Let's go through them one by one. Starting off with codominance. It's kind of giving you a hint in the name. Co, because both are being expressed. Kind of think codominance almost as co-parenting. When you hear people talk about co-parenting, that means both of the parents, even though they're not together, they're still both parenting the kid. That's co-parenting. So I have a slight accent if it doesn't sound right. Co-parenting. But this is co-dominance. Co-dominance is when both of the alleles are expressed. That's weird, because we've heard that normally just one of the alleles get expressed, the dominant one. But sometimes, both alleles are expressed. Think of people who are heterozygotes. What's an example of a heterozygote, person with two different alleles, where both of the alleles are expressed? It's actually your blood type. Okay. Yeah. An example is the AB blood type. You're an A type because you have the A allele. So you have the A uh, antigen on your red blood cells. But you also have the B antigen, because you're a B type also, because you carry the B allele. Both alleles are being expressed. This is codominance. Happens sometimes. Think your blood type if you're something like an AB type. If you're an A type, that means you only have the A alleles. If you're B type, that means you only have the B alleles. If you're an O type like me, it means you have neither of them. Uh-oh. Mm. But that's an example of codominance. Think AB blood types. It's because they have both the A allele and the B allele, and they're both expressed. And both alleles are expressed. That is codominance. Let's do another example. Another example is having multiple alleles, multiple allele inheritance. Oh, we kind of see that in codominance. They got multiple alleles. I'm seeing two. But you can have even more. Uh-oh. Okay. Again, it's an example is your blood type. For your blood type, you need many alleles to express your blood type. Remember, your it's three antigens possible to be on your blood on your red blood cells: the A antigen, the B antigen, and the Rh antigen to tell you if you're positive or negative. 
It takes many antigens for you to technically get your blood type because each an uh, many alleles, sorry, for you to get your blood type because each allele will give you a specific antigen. And it turns out the A, A allele and the B allele are the dominant ones. They will get expressed if they're present. If you're O type, the O type is recessive. So we'll get overshadowed by the dominant types. That's why if you're O type blood, it means you did not have the A and B allele. Because if you did, it would have been expressed. Why? Because the O allele is recessive. But very simply, what does it mean when you have multiple allele inheritance? It tells you the name. It means you've inherited multiple alleles. And sometimes you need to do that, like determining your blood type. Oh, here's another one. It's called incomplete dominance. Again, it's giving you a hint in the name. Incomplete dominance. An allele is not completely masking the other. The dominant allele is not completely masking the recessive. An example we see, let me mention a, a different example before we get to this one on the picture. Oh, this is an example that they usually show in general biology classes. It's rose color. You can have a red rose, a white rose, or a pink rose. The pink rose is an example of incomplete dominance. How? Well, if you're red, in terms of rose color, it's because you have the dominant red rose color allele. If you're white, it's because you have the recessive allele, which will give you the white color, which is the absence of color, technically. But if you're pink, it's because you've blended the two. That red didn't quite outshadow the white. It didn't completely mask the white, so it made it kind of pale and look pink. That's kind of an example of incomplete dominance. In roses. But what about for humans? For humans, an example is sickle cell anemia. This is when your red blood cells literally sickle. They look like a crescent moon or a sickle. Think uh, uh, the character Death. Whenever you see someone dressed up as Death, it's carrying this staff with this kind of crescent moon-shaped knife at the tip. That's a, that's a sickle. Your red blood cells could sickle like that. And that's bad. And sickle cell anemia causes your red blood cells to form this crescent moon shape which would inhibit your ability to transport oxygen. So you do not want sickle cell anemia. And it's, a, and it's an inheritable trait. It's the result of you getting the sickle cell gene. Turns out the sickle cell genes are thanks to alleles. It's a recessive allele. Okay, so if you have both the recessive alleles, homozygous recessive, you will have sickle-shaped cells. If you have the dominant allele, that's normal. You'll have a normal red blood cell. So you can imagine if you're homozygous dominant, your blood is normal. You have the normal red blood cell. If you're homozygous recessive, oh, you'll definitely have sickle cell. But then there's incomplete dominance. This is more for heterozygotes again. That dominant allele did not completely mask the recessive. How does that look in sickle cell anemia? We call these people carriers. And carriers of sickle cell anemia typically have mild symptoms. They do have some sickle cells, just not as many as the homozygous recessive. Why? Because their cells are trying to be normal because they have the capital S, they have the dominant allele, but it's not completely shutting out this recessive allele. So some cells are sickling. Not as many as a full-blown sickle-celled patient, but they will have some mild symptoms because they have some cells sickling. You're not completely knocking out or masking this recessive allele. That is incomplete dominance. Definition is more of this second bullet point. The dominant allele does not completely mask the recessive. Now you know.
Two more. Polygenic inheritance and pleiotropy. Let's do a polygenic inheritance first. Okay. Poly means many. Genetic is for genes. Polygenic inheritance is when many genes, are really many traits, sorry, are controlled by one gene. So many traits are controlled by one gene. Okay. Oh, sorry. Many traits are controlled by more than one gene. For example, your eye color. Yeah. I, I mentioned earlier, I was trying to keep it simple. Yes, you have an allele to help with your eye color, but you actually have many alleles to help with eye color. My brown eyes are the result of many alleles. That's an example of polygenic inheritance. It's just not, it's not just one gene that tells you your eye color. It's not just one gene that tells you your height. So there's gonna be many genes with many versions, aka alleles, telling you your height or your eye color, for example. This is how you can have parents who have the same eye color, but they can have a kid with a totally different eye color. One their families have never seen before. So you possibly having many alleles and you didn't notice because you had so many. It takes many alleles to give your eye color. So yes, me as a brown eyed person, you might see me with brown eyes, but deep in my genes, I might have an allele for blue eyes. It's possible, why? Because there's many genes giving me my eye color. Same thing for your height. And for your skin color, when you need more gene to give you a particular phenotype, a particular look, we call that polygenic inheritance. Sorry for the confusion I stumbled in the beginning. But that's it. many genes for one particular trait. And then there's pleiotropy. Pleiotropy. Okay. This is kind of the opposite of polygenic inheritance. Polygenic inheritance is one trait being the result of many genes. Pleiotropy is one gene giving you many traits. Yeah. An example is Marfan syndrome. It's the result of one mutation in one gene. Okay. But this one gene will affect many parts of the body many traits. So when we talk about Marfan syndrome, this is a cluster of different things you're going to see in one person because it came from one gene that happened to influence many parts of your body. In Marfan's disease, this is a problem with uh, a protein in your connective tissue. And, and this protein is in many different structures, like in the lens of your eye or in the connective tissue in the walls of your aorta. They, these tend to be very tall people with lots of flexibility. So flexible, things tend to fall out of place, like the lens of the eye. It literally gets dislocated. It shifts in the eye, and they'll have vision problems. Their aorta will get kind of weak and possibly burst. So you tend to see aortic aneurysms and ruptures they die from in pleiotropy. They'll have long fingers in, in addition to being tall themselves. Yeah, you're seeing many outcomes, many, many phenotypical representations from one gene. That is pleiotropy. So sometimes that tiny little Punnett square is not gonna help give you the full picture because you gotta account for all these different impacts on your phenotype. Sometimes it's one gene giving you many phenotypes or sometimes it's more than one gene giving you just one phenotype. So yeah, it gets a little complicated sometimes. So there's many things that needed to occur for you to be formed, yeah. Now you know. Then the last thing we talk about, kind of just to finish up our genetics talk, is kind of revisiting sex determination. Okay. Remember, it's determined by your sex chromosomes, that last pair, that 23rd pair. And remember, it's just two chromosomes here, an X and a Y. 
And I want you to know females have two X chromosomes as their 23rd set or 23rd pair, while males have an X and a Y. It's because of what the cells carry. Egg cells only carry X chromosomes. So females only have X chromosomes. But a sperm cell could carry either X or Y. So when it comes to determining sex, it's really the male who does it. Over years, over centuries, we've seen males blame females for not having sons or, or only having daughters. Like King Henry VIII went through a couple different wives because he couldn't have a son. And he blamed his wives. Turns out it was his fault. It was his sperm cell's fault. Why? Because only the male's sperm cell carries the Y chromosome. And the Y chromosome is what you need to form a male. So if you only have girls as a male, you could only blame yourself. Because only you have the Y chromosome. And only the Y chromosome lets you become a male. Uh-oh, now you know. And we can predict the probability of having a son. Because we know the sex chromosomes, and we know females are XX, and we know males are, are XY. So we could determine what would be the offspring. Well, if I could go to the next slide. Let me move this out of the way. Oh, there we go. We got to draw our Punnett square again. So a male and a female come together. What's the odds of them having a female and the odds of them having a male? Fill out the Punnett square. Remember, fill it out across the row and the column. Put the alleles in each box. X goes here and over here. This X goes here and down here. This X goes here and over here. Then the Y is filling in this column. Turns out it's a 50-50 chance. Every pregnancy. These numbers don't change. If you had four, four previous daughters and the next pregnancy, it's still a 50-50 chance. Okay. So why do males, or some males have only females, only daughters? I don't know, look at the draw. Because okay. according to your genes, it's a 50-50 chance every time. Okay. And then there's those other 22 pairs. They're autosomes, meaning they do not determine sex. They do not determine gender. They do everything else. They help with the other parts of your phenotype, like eye color, height, skin color, all those previous other non-sex related things that we talked about. And yes, things can even go wrong with the autosomes, besides the ones we've mentioned already, like cystic fibrosis. You can have Down syndrome. That's a problem also in your autosomes. I want you to know, what is the problem in Down syndrome? It kind of gives you the, a hint in, as to the problem in its other name. Another name for Down syndrome is trisomy 21. This is when you have an extra copy of chromosome 21. Remember, you should only have two pairs of every chromosome. Okay. Or, or two of every chromosome. You should only have a pair. And here's chromosome 21. You should only have two chromosomes here. But in Down syndrome, they have an extra one. So you would see a third little symbol down here in, in Down syndrome. That tiny little extra chromosome would lead to Down syndrome and all the physiological effects that come with it. Yeah. That's it. Keep it simple. Down syndrome, a.k.a. trisomy 21, is when you have an extra copy of chromosome 21. You have three copies instead of two. How does this happen? It's due to chromosomes not separating correctly during meiosis, which is the division of your chromosomes. When chromosomes don't separate, we call that non-disjunction. They are stuck together. They do not separate, non-disjunction. So you'll have this extra copy. Since your likelihood of this happening, this non-disjunction as a female, increases with age. So you tend to see Down syndrome in older females. That's why if you're an older female, and by older, the doctors usually say over 30, you're at risk of having non-disjunction. It's like your chromosomes get sticky and they don't separate. And you'll run the risk of having extra chromosomes. Yeah.
That's down to here's the picture here. They have literally just one. There, everything else is normal. They just have this one little extra chromosome, and you'll have all those phenotypes of Down syndrome. Yeah. And the last thing here is a sex link trait. Okay, almost done. Two more slides, and we're done. A sex link trait. There are traits related to the sex chromosomes. That's all that means. Besides just giving you your sex, there are other things linked to your sex chromosomes. Things that can sometimes be considered negative, like color blindness. Red green color blindness is an X linked trait. It's an X linked recessive trait, meaning it's a recessive allele linked to the X chromosome. So if you have two of these recessive alleles on the X chromosome, you might be colorblind. Same thing for hemophilia, where you won't clot your blood and you are at risk of bleeding. That's an X-linked recessive trait. Or Duchenne muscular dystrophy. These are traits linked to the X chromosome, which is a sex chromosome. That's all a sex-linked trait is. It's just a trait linked to your sex chromosomes, either the X chromosome or the Y. But it's more you more common in the X chromosome. X chromosome tends to have several X linked traits or sex linked traits to it. Like color blindness, hemophilia, muscular dystrophy. So for you to have an X linked recessive trait, it's because you're likely homozygous for this recessive trait. I Meaning you got a recessive X allele from the mom and uh, possible, and or, from the dad. Yeah. I say and or, because if you're female, remember that's XX, so it means you got the recessive X from your dad and the recessive X for your mom. But if you're a male, oh, you can blame your mom, because you'll get your X chromosome from your mom and the Y chromosome from your dad. So you tend to see things, for example, like Duchenne muscular dystrophy, a muscle problem, literally, in males, because they get the X-linked recessive trait from their mom. Yeah. Muscular dystrophy gets passed, or develops in males from their mom's X chromosome. Why? Because they get the Y chromosome from their dad. Now you know. Same thing for color blindness. Color blindness, for you to be color blind fully, you need to have both recessive alleles. So if you're a female who's color blind, you got to blame both your parents. You got the X from your mom and the X from your dad. If you're a color blind male, you could just blame your mom because it's an X linked trait and you get the X from your mom, you get the X from your dad or the Y from your dad. That's all it means to be X-linked. You're linked to the sex chromosomes. Either the Y chromosome, we call you X-linked, or yes, uh, there's some linked to the Y chromosome. We call them Y-linked traits. Yeah. But X is more common. He made it through development. He made it through chapter 20. You finished with all the lectures. You made it through lecture portion of this course.